So uh, I'm here to talk about a group of super normal people who are elite Kenyan distance runners. And I'm going to try to convince you, if we can have the first slide, that the Kenyans tell us or maybe want to let us, uh, as we think about what determines human biology and what determines what phenotypes we see, that uh, before we drink a lot of Kool-Aid about omics, we might want to run away from it for at least a minute. And these guys are obviously not Kenyans. On the left is Nanook of the North from a famous documentary movie made in the 1930s about how a primitive hunter-gatherer lived. And on the right is a man named Matthew Elliott, who was a 442 high school miler, who I believe just qualified for the world championships. And I'll come back to talk about uh, Nanook and Mr. Elliott here in a little bit. But what about the Kenyans? And let's not forget the Ethiopians. There's about 40 million people living in Kenya, about 80 million in Ethiopia. They dominate world-class running in the Olympics, world champions, they have world records, and so forth. More importantly, more importantly, at least for the Kenyans, they come from a tribal group of only 5 million people. So it's not like every Kenyan is a good runner. It's the people who live up in the mountains and the highlands from the Kalenjin tribal group. And what's even crazier about it is many are related. And here are the two main East African archetypes. On the left is, uh, or, yeah, on the left is Abibi Bakila, who won the Olympic uh, marathon in 1916, and also 1964. You'll notice he's running barefoot. So uh, this is a second wave of interest in barefoot or minimal shoe running. Uh, he started off wearing shoes in that race, uh, but he hadn't worn them much in training, so he took them off halfway and finished and won. And on the right is uh, Kipyogi Kano, who was the first great Kenyan one, runner, who. Uh, uh, won a gold medal in 1968 uh, and also 1972. And what you might be expecting from this talk goes something like this. Kenyan runners dominate international competition. We're all aware of that. Several genes have been identified that are responsible for their success. I'm going to tell you how these genes influence exercise capacity. And this really is related to one of the things that's happened in the last 10 or 20 years is this idea that common genetic variants would explain common phenotypes. And this is perhaps an athletic version of this, that there would be a, a common genetic explanation for this common variant uh, or common phenotype that we see in Kenyan athletes. And so now we can go home because I've given you the bottom line for my talk, but not really. Now, if we'd had this conversation in 1913, right after the 1912 Olympics, we'd be talking about three men. Jim Thorpe, Duke Kahanamuku, and Louis Tiwanima. Jim Thorpe and Louis Tiwanima were Native Americans. Uh, Duke Kahanamuku was a uh, Hawaiian, and they dominated the 1912 Olympics. And there was discussion at that time about what inherited factors permitted these men to be so dominant. Thorpe won the pentathlon and the decathlon. Duke Kahanamuku set a world record in the 100 meter swimming the first time he swam a race, the first time he swam a race. He's also the, essentially the inventor, or at least a popularizer, of surfing. And then Louis Tiwanima is a uh, Hopi Indian who was one of the few people to ever challenge the Finns, who were just as dominant as the Kenyans are now. So this conversation would be very different 100 years ago. Now, what about the Finns of the early 1900s? If we were having this conversation in 1933, we'd be having this conversation about what is genetically special about the Finns. They held every world record in the 10,000 meters from 1912 to 1944. If we were having this conversation after World War II, it would be about the Eastern Europeans who held seven of nine five-kilometer records and 10, 10 10K records. Uh, in the middle panel here, leading is a Russian man named Vladimir Kutz, who was a notoriously brutal trainer, and Kutz said his strategy was simply to drown people in a sea of lactic acid. And finally, if we'd had this conversation in the 60s, we'd want to know what was special about our friends down under and also in New Zealand. There were three men, this is Peter Schnell on the, on the uh, bottom picture, from a single Auckland suburb who were gold medalists. So this is not a new conversation. We might also be discussing why, uh, why, why, uh, why, why Jewish athletes dominate professional basketball if we'd been having this conversation in the 40s. So a lot of things change, but maybe a lot of things stay the same. So what makes a good runner? Well, the first thing you have to have is a high maximal oxygen uptake. And this is related to your pulmonary diffusing capacity, how big your lungs are, how much surface area your lungs are, how they transfer oxygen. You have to have a big heart and a large cardiac output. You've got to have plenty of red cells in your blood. And you've got to be able to get that blood to the skeletal muscles that are exercising. 
And on the right side of this, you can see treadmill running speed up to about 25 kilometers an hour. 20 kilometers an hour is five minute miles. And you can see this is an individual who was an NCAA cross country champion, had a VO2 peak of about 82 mLs per kg per minute. That's twice normal. And uh, you can see that as he continues to go faster and faster, the yellow line shows his oxygen uptake goes up and then it finally levels off at maximum. And what happens in this slide is you look at a group of uh, seven individuals who stopped training for 12 weeks. These three individuals had been uh, NCAA Division I cross country athletes. Uh, everybody else was just sort of an average citizen who trained a lot. They stopped training and you see at the end of 12 weeks, these individuals had had about a 20% reduction in their exercise capacity. But what's quite interesting about this is they ended up about where hunter-gatherers are. So if you're just a physically active, young, healthy male, and you live in an elementary culture where you're doing work all day long, chasing game, uh, doing non-mechanized farming like the Amish, your VO2 max is gonna be about 55 or 60. Now this is called the lactate threshold. We've all heard about lactic acid. And what you see here is that as the treadmill velocity goes up, you go from having almost no lactic acid in your blood to a whole lot in your blood. And it turns out right at that break point is about the speed that people run the marathon at. So people run their marathon at a point where they have a lactate level of one or two, maybe three. They don't run at maximum. The other thing you need to think about is why trained people can go so much faster without making lactic acid than untrained people. So you see glucose, we all hear about glucose when we drink our Gatorade. Glucose gets metabolized to something called pyruvate. And then pyruvate tries to get into something in the cell called the mitochondria, which is the energy factory in a cell. If the pyruvate can't get into the mitochondria, you make lactate out of it. And eventually, if you make a lot of lactate, you're not gonna go very fast for very long. If you perform regular endurance activity, you essentially double the number of mitochondria in your skeletal muscle. All that glucose that gets turned into pyruvate can get taken up by the mitochondria and you make very, very little lactic acid. This happens in almost anybody who trains. Almost anybody who trains can double the number of mitochondria in their skeletal muscle. Now what about running speed? So you, you and how about efficiency? So on the bottom of this is the oxygen cost to run a given speed. And you, the green line shows people that can't go very fast for a given amount of oxygen. The red line is average. And the yellow uh, dots and the blue line show what happens when you have so-called superior efficiency or superior running economy. You can run faster for a given oxygen consumption. And in fact, there's people with a value on the x-axis of 60 who can run 20 kilometers an hour or about uh, 12 miles an hour. Now let's go back to this genetic story. So we've told you that VO2 max is important, we've told you the lactate threshold is important, and we've told you that running economy is important. But now let's look what we know about the genetics or the omics of this. The yellow line shows us the distribution of about 100 genes that are thought to influence endurance performance in the Spanish population. The uh, orange line, the orange with the triangle, shows us a subset of individuals who were st studied for this particular uh, uh, experiment. And then the blue sample is from about uh, 46 elite Spanish athletes. These are individuals who are world-class distance runners, participants in the Tour de France, and so forth. And you can see that the, the uh, elite endurance athletes are shifted to the right, but there's another way to look at this. There are plenty of elite athletes that have scores of 40 or 50 or 60. And there's a large sweet spot, and you might conclude that only a very limited number of people are excluded on a genetic basis from being elite athletes, or at least elite endurance athletes. So only about 20% of people are excluded on the genetic basis. And this just shows you what happens if you take this total uh, genotype score and do something called an area under the curve analysis. And if genes were so important in endurance running, the area under that curve would be really, really high Instead of about uh, 0.56, it would be more like 0.75 or 0.8 or 0.85. So genetics play a role, but it's not that big a role. So what about the Kenyans? Again, 40 million people, they dominate world-class running. The Olympics, world champions, uh, world records, and so forth. Runners, as I told you, from a limited tribal group, physically active from childhood. 
many are related, and except for running economy, except for running economy, they have unremarkable physiological variables. So let's look at what we know about them. Why are they so good? One, they're small. Two, they run a lot. Three, they live at altitude. Four, they have tremendous economic motivation. Per capita income in Kenya is $800 a year. Per capita income in Ethiopia is $400 a year. So if you win the New York Marathon and make $50,000, you're doing OK. Uh, size makes a difference. I looked at the 50 men who had uh, broken 27 minutes for 10,000 meters in a little study that we did. Their average height was 168 centimeters, and they weighed 56 kilograms. How many people here in this room weigh less than 56 kilograms? All right, so we don't have any candidates for world records here in the room. On the uh, left panel is we see uh, kilograms on the bottom, 70, 80, 90, and 100. And these are an elite Danish endurance athletes. There are not a lot of good distance runners in Denmark, but there are some good cyclists and there are some excellent kayakers and rowers who typically tend to be big people. And that's where the Kenyans fall in. So the Kenyans are, are 15 kilos uh, lighter than the lightest elite Danish endurance athlete. And if you look at the uh, standard height and weight charts for the United States, you see that you would be in the lowest 5% of height and weight as a 20-year-old male if you want to be an elite endurance athlete. So size is genetic. How many people here think size is genetic? Well, let's take a look. You're right, it's genetic. There have been about 100 different alleles uh, or gene variants associated with height. Most of them explain about 0.2 centimeters. That's two millimeters. And they're, they're uh, very, very uncommon. If you do the math, there are a large number of variants, small effect size. And if you do complex statistical models, Modeling explains only 3 to 20 percent of height, and it's worse than the predictions made from the Galtonian era, which occurred uh, around the turn of the century, when you can take the height of your mother, the height of your father, the height of the kid at age two years and come up with a better answer. And we'll just ask the Japanese how they feel about it. So Japanese people have gotten about uh, 10 to 20 centimeters higher over the last 100 years. There has not been a lot of immigration to Japan. It's one of the most ethnically homogeneous places on Earth. And I think this slide shows you just how important the environment, nutrition, and other factors are in height. And it's true for the general population. It's true for the military conscripts. The, the upper lines are for people that are better educated, and the lower lines for the general population. And you see that the better educated people are always ahead of the general population, maybe because they were richer and ate better. And then you see the general population catching up after World War II with the economic miracle uh, in Japan. Now, if I only knew then what I knew now, this is me running in about 1979 at the University of Arizona. I'm 195 centimeters, and I weigh 80 kilograms, and I was pretty good. But if I'd known what I know uh, then what I know now, I think I would have jumped into the pool. Uh, this is Michael Phelps, who has 22 medals. Uh, uh, Ian Thorpe, nine medals, and Alex Popoff, nine medals, and they're all exactly 195 centimeters tall. So I guess I missed the bus on that one. Uh, now, here's a couple of other things that are clearly genetic. On the right, we see uh, Western European kids uh, practicing their driving skills, and on the left, we see Kenyan kids running to school. Uh, so how genetic is this? Uh, altitude and lung surface area. This is on the, a very old study, but on the uh, x-axis, the bottom axis, it's the duration of time you've lived at high altitude. And on the left axis is a marker of just how big your lungs are. And it turns out if you've spent your whole life at a place like Leadville, Colorado, which is about 9,000 feet, your lungs are going to be bigger and they're going to exchange oxygen better. So again, not genetic, environmental. So we have two big things that are uh, not genetic or environmental. Did you run to school? Did you live at high altitude? And that brings me to Matthew Elliott. So he was a 442 high school miler, miler. He had limited exposure to running in college. He kept running after college when he was in graduate school, and now he's a 355 miler. And I started looking at this, and this is the world according to Frank Shorter, who won the Olympic marathon in 1972. And there's a famous quote when somebody told Frank Shorter that they had run 430 mile in high school. He said, how did I know you ran the mile in 430 in high school? That's easy. Everyone ran the mile in 430 in high school. So that seems to be sort of a cutoff. If a kid can run uh, four minutes and 30 seconds for the mile in high school, they have a chance to be pretty good. So let's make a few estimates. There's about 2 million boys born per year in the United States. 
based on size and genetics, perhaps 40 to 80,000 have the talent. In other words, are small enough to be good. Uh, about between two and 3,000 uh, high school juniors and seniors break four minutes and 30 seconds per year in the United States. Between two and 3,000, what happens to these guys? Well, in the olden days, they kept running. And you can see this peak in about 1983. So starting in the 1960s, more and more of these over 30 milers continued to run in college, continued to run after college. And um, there were nearly 300 performances uh, of sub-220 marathons in 1983. Then something happened. Uh, maybe it was video games. Maybe people lost interest in running. And you can see uh, that there was this huge drop-off in elite uh, marathon performances in the United States. And it's hard for me to believe that there's been any genetic modifications in the average 17 or 18-year-old boy that have occurred between 1983 and 2012 that might explain this. So again, you have an example, at least for running, where culture beats genetics. And I want to show you another example uh, here of a man named Jim Ryan. Jim Ryan, in 1967, ran a 351 one mile. He was 20 years old. He did it on a dirt track. That converts to about a 345 mile uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on a modern track. 30, 343 is the current world record. He did this with no rabbit. He wasn't getting paid, and he clearly wasn't doping. So there's plenty of talent out there. And what you conclude from all this is that for at least elite athletic performance, and perhaps elite performance of any type, any type, talent identification and retention matters. There typically are not deterministic genes. There's a big genetic sweet spot, and the environment matters, and motivation, motivation, motivation. So when I look at data like this, and I translate it to my life as a physician and think about diseases, you always have to ask yourself, for what disease or what collection of diseases does culture matter more than genes? And I think when you ask that question, you're going to conclude that for many, many common diseases, culture does, in fact, uh, count for more than genes. Now, we have a little video on this next slide. And if I'm invited back next year, we're going to talk about why white men can't jump. Det kommer bli, det kommer bli avbrott, kanske för prisutdelningar, för uh, grenar som passerar på löpabanan och sådär. Men den som lyckas hålla fokuset, den som inte blir störd av omgivningen, den kommer stå fall i Aten. That's Thomas Holm, who's 5 feet 11 inches tall and can high jump 7 feet 11. Thank you very much. First off, um, let me just note, you, you have some pretty awesome shoes on there, I have to say. Um, you're a runner, right? Yeah. And uh, how, how much did your sort of spirit of scientific inquiry lead you to ask questions about your own limitations uh, based on cultural, it's, genetic, and... It's worse than that, John. So uh, I was flunking out of college at the University of Arizona and signed up to become a Tucson City fireman when I was recruited to be a subject in a study. And uh, I was about 19 years old at the time. And, and through dumb luck, it turned out to be a world-class lab that was interested in the uh, limits of human performance. And uh, that's what got me started in all this. So you went from guinea pig to doctor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Some people would say I'm still a guinea pig, but that's a separate issue. And, yeah. I, and actually, I volunteer for my own studies when I can. Um, let's talk about what went on in world culture in some of the periods that you describe in right. athletics, the turn of the century, um, the mid-century, we were really at a period of a closing of a chapter of comparative geographic isolation of Absolutely. athletic groups. And I'm wondering if interest in how seeing for the first time Japanese or New Zealanders or Kenyans run l l encouraged us to think in the wrong way, precisely the wrong way about genetics let us on a wild goose chase as opposed to uh, uh, posed informed questions. Yeah, because things happen sort of one at a time. And, and what you see, in, as, if you look at these groups that have been dominant for different periods of time, they come from physically active cultures where people have enough to eat but not too much to eat. They come from cultures that have a whole bunch of emphasis on toughness, uh, which certainly the Finns have this concept of Sisu. The Native Americans also have a similar concept. The Eastern Europeans, uh, if you had a choice of living in a communist country or doing athletic training, uh, living as kind of a worker in a, in a worker's paradise, I think you'd pick athletic training no matter how difficult it was. If you look at how those men lived in Australia and New Zealand, again, uh, they were not watching a lot of TV, physically active early on. And in fact, there was a, a whole bunch of good, 
good runners in the U.S. in the 60s and 70s. And again, if you talk to those individuals, they were riding their bicycles to school, playing a variety of sports and so forth. And the other interesting thing, John, is you see this whole experience compressed for women once they were permitted to participate in the 1970s. Any cultural genetic supposition about why the Finns might be so good at making cell phones but can't seem to overtake the Koreans? No, I, I don't have any, any supposition for that. But I do. And do you don't think, own Nokia stock? No, I don't own any Nokia stock. But one of the things you notice if you go to Scandinavia is um, these are small countries, and, and they recognize at some level they have to compete or die. And they do a very, very good job of integrating technology, research, and the universities and academic structures so they kind of fight above their weight class. And you know, we can be a little bit sloppy here because we have you know, 50 or 100 or 200 big research universities. And, and they have to really focus on, on one. And one of the things that we, we talked about in the back before the thing started is we take that for granted, but it can die off pretty quickly if we don't do something about the federal funding situation in support of curiosity-driven research. Dr. Joyner, thanks so much. <laughs>